So thanks so much to you, Song and Ugo for inviting me and organizing this talk series. Uh, my name is Ethan Mandelow. I'm currently in the process of finishing up my PhD in the Interactive Audio Lab at Northwestern University, where I work with Professor Brian Pardo. Uh, I also work part-time as a student researcher on the Magenta team at Google Brain. Um, in this talk, I'm going to talk about some of my work exploring both musical scene analysis and generative modeling and how both of these things can be blended together and kind of um, provide um, some, some symbiosis for both of these tasks. So let's dive into it. Um, over the course of human history, we have a species that spent a lot of time and energy developing technology so we can create music. Each new type of musical instrument doesn't just enable new ways to create music, but it also brings with it new ways to conceptualize what music is. Today, me and a bunch of other researchers, probably you people, are looking at uh, machine learning systems that can add new types of musical instruments to this lineage. And the question is, how? Well, if we're thinking of machine learning in it as an instrument, well, then the first most obvious way that it fits into this lineage is that we want some kind of system that can generate sound based on some input controls. And this is familiar to how we normally think about musical instruments, change a knob, hear a different sound. But because machine learning is this new, great, malleable, exciting technology, we can also ask it to listen and analyze the audio in new, sophisticated ways and ask these analysis models to use what they've learned to assist in our sound generation models. And this is kind of the core idea of what I'm going to talk about today. So these paradigms of generation analysis have fancier names. In machine learning, a process of creating data like musical audio is called generative modeling. And similarly, I'm going to call the process of analyzing a piece of musical audio um, as musical scene analysis. I'm going to talk about these more in depth and give you better definitions in just a moment. But uh, here I'm just going to make the case that ideas for one can be used to further the goals of the other and vice versa. So in this talk, I'm going to showcase a handful of projects that span both generative modeling and musical scene analysis. And the theme that's going to run through all of these projects is that ideas from generation and analysis can be blended together to accomplish the goals of the project at hand. So first, let me provide a quick definition of generative modeling. Let's say we have a set of audio recordings like uh, these three violin excerpts here. We can think of these excerpts as existing in some sort of space, for example, the space of their waveforms as a collection of audio samples, or maybe the space of their notes, etc. And these are just three of many possible examples of plausible violin excerpts, and these others are denoted by these dots on this page. And we say that these examples are drawn from some probability distribution P data, data with a D. The probability distribution that we saw in those dots is actually part of this underlying distribution of all possible violin excerpts. And because there's clearly a, an, an infinite number of ways to alter a violin excerpt, think about recording the same excerpt in a reverb, reverb room, maybe changing a sample or two, changing a note, changing the articulation on a note, this underlying distribution is, for all intents and purposes, unknowable. In generative modeling, we want to take a model P theta, the Greek letter theta, that approximates this underlying distribution, given only the set of examples that we see in our data set. And that would be all the dots from the few slides ago. So when this model is trained, we can create new data by sampling from this distribution that the model has learned. In this case, we're going to get a brand new, never before heard violin excerpt that doesn't match any of the, hopefully doesn't match any of the, the data that was in our original data set. So, so in summary, in general modeling, we want to learn some model that approximates the distribution of our data. And then we want to sample that model from that model to create new data. Later in the talk, I'll discuss some ideas that musical scene analysis will borrow from generative modeling, namely the idea of sampling itself, as well as neural network architectures used in generative modeling, and sometimes entire pre-trained models. So now I'm going to turn to defining musical scene analysis. Musical scene analysis is a subset of machine learning specifically targeting musical audio. Sometimes this is called machine listening, but I like the term musical scene analysis because there are specific aspects of music that, are, you know, that we have tasks for specifically. And to that end, the goal of this field is to identify and locate the key aspects of music that humans attend to when they listen to songs. So some common musical scene analysis tasks include things like automatic music tagging, fundamental frequency estimation, automatic music transcription, and source separation. Later in the talk, I'll just talk about one transcription project and two source separation projects. And I'll give details about these tasks when I get to those projects. But the key takeaway here is that these models aren't creating new data like in generative modeling but they're producing a far more compact and therefore a lossy way to represent the audio data that we have for a goal of anal the, the goal of analysis. So let me jump into these projects here. And first, I'm going to talk about a project led by uh, Mila's very own Yu Song Wu, uh, which is MIDI DSP, uh, a generative modeling for musical audio. 
Most generative modeling for music results in models that directly, directly output audio waveforms, offering little control, if any at all. And if we're lucky, the generative model let us convert some notes into audio, but there's still really not a way to make edits to how these notes are performed. For musicians, creating music is not just a one and done process. We wanna be able to control different aspects of the performance. For example, if you could hear this, uh, I'm gonna play for you a violin, violin excerpt from Phantom of the Opera. And just so you can follow along visually, here's what the musical score looks like. Um, at the bottom, here's the spectrogram visualization of the, of the violin. And in the middle, I'll show you this pitch contour of the violin playing. Maybe you won't be able to hear this, but for me, I'm gonna to listen to this violin excerpt right now. So I don't think there's any audio coming out, but um, I guess we're just gonna have to live with that right now. So you can see this, the, here's the, the, the pitch contour will actually show you a lot of what's going on right here when I show the next slide. So let's say your violin wants to make a lot of edits to the initial performance of this Phantom of the Opera excerpt. For instance, they can make low level edits like adding a pitch bend to the first and the second note shown in yellow. They can change how these notes are played like adding more vibrato to the second note and changing the articulation of these descending notes shown in green. And finally, they can change the notes themselves, like shifting up these last two notes up an octave. So um, I'm gonna play what these edits sound like and you're not gonna be able to hear them, but know that we have really clear uh, control over both high level aspects of the performance, like these notes, um, as well as low level aspects, such as like the pitch contour or the artic articulation. Um, and so these are the edits that musicians wanna be able to make when they're making music. So the kind of the core question uh, here is how can we make generative models that enable these levels of control? Um, and I'm sure you'd be very wowed to hear if you could hear the audio that both of these audio clips that I assure you sound very much like violins because you song did a great job on this project. Um, they both come from this MIDI DDSP model. And so in the next few slides, uh, even though maybe you song has already recapped this and we'll also be doing this presentation at iClear in a few weeks, um, I'm gonna just go over uh, how MIDI DDSP works. Um, so MIDI DDSP can turn a musical score into realistic sounding synthesized performance while also enabling detailed control of the performance. MIDI DDSP itself is a structured hierarchy with three modules that allow manipulating representations at different time scales. Each of these modules does its own form of analysis of the audio signal to provide controls when we want to generate audio. So I'll first talk about the audio synthesis module. And as you can probably guess from the name, the synthesis happens with a DDSP component. So DDSP stands for Differentiable Digital Signal Processing and allows neural networks to learn how to synthesize audio by manipulating a simple set of DSP elements, such as the pitch contour shown in red, amplitude below that, harmonics and noise components, all of a single note audio excerpt. These four elements are called the synthesis parameters collectively, and they happen 250 times a second. What's happening here is that the network is, has to analyze how these elements are combined to make the music so that it can synthesize them. The original DDSP autoencoder, and as well as the one used in MIDI DDSP, is what's called an analysis by synthesis model. So now we can move on to the middle level, the note expression module, where we transform the low-level synthesis parameters into a set of high-level note attributes. As I mentioned before, the raw DDSP synthesis parameters are very happen very quickly and are very high-dimensional. So in light of this, in DDSP, we want to extract a set of summary statistics that determine the expression of each note individually. Hark, another analysis step. We define six summary statistics that are analyzed from the synthesis parameters and dynamically pooled over the duration of the note. And when we're done with this, we're left with six controls that occur once per note versus the 125 synthesis parameters that happen 250 times a second. To generate these synthesis parameters from a set of note expressions, we use an autoaggressive RNN and GAN. If you're curious about the details of this, you can see our paper for, for more information on that. But I actually just wanna look at one of these note expressions just to get an idea for how they work. So and we'll look at vibrato, which describes the amount of oscillation or wobble in the pitch of a note. In MIDI DSP, we can set these values for each note. So here we set vibrato at 36% for the first note and 82% for the second note. And we can see that the amount of oscillation in the pitch contour for the first note is smaller than the second. We can also set these values very low and just turn off vibrato completely. Notice how there's just one control that lasts for the entire duration of the note, no matter how long the note lasts. So the final piece is the expression generator, which will generate performance characteristics by controlling those note expression summary statistics I just described. 
Because the previous module, the note expression module, does most of the heavy lifting here, the generation of these six expression controls per note is actually relatively simple. We simply use another autoregressive RNN to predict these six dimension uh, note values for each note. So you're not going to be able to hear this, but I'm sure because Yusong has presented this before, you've maybe heard this example. And if you haven't, um, I encourage you to go to the MIDI DSP website, which I'll link at the end of this section at the end of the slides, to um, to listen to these examples because they're like probably the coolest thing that Yusong's done. I can't do enough to to build up Yusong, uh, who led this project, but the cooler things that we one of the cooler things we can do with MIDI DSP is combine it with another model. So. Um, what we do in this example is we take this uh, familiar no, uh, note sequence like Ode to Joy uh, from Beethoven, and we can give it to a coconut model, the model behind the, the Google Bach Doodle. And coconut would write three additional note sequences that are going to harmonize this Ode to Joy melody in the style of a Bach chorale. We then synthesize each of them with a MIDI DDSP instrument model, and the result is a MIDI DDSP quartet, where every aspect other than the original melody is composed and performed by a machine learning system. So this ensemble is uh, amazing, and I can't believe it was performed by a computer and not a set of musicians. So I would encourage you to go on this website on your screen, gco slash magenta slash midi dsp and check out your classmate Yusong's work and hear how great that sounds. Um, so that's midi dsp a generative model that enables realistic synthesis and expressive control. As I mentioned, Yusong led this, led this work, and he's going to present it at, at uh, iClear in a month or so. But as I was describing MIDI DDSP, I made sure to point out parts of the model that relied on some kind of analysis. However, there was one really important point that I omitted, and that's, because, that's that MIDI DDSP needs to be trained on single instrument audio that has aligned transcription data. Most of the audio that we hear out in the world has multiple instruments and doesn't come with aligned transcription data at all. So the question is, how do we get it? Well, we'll talk about how we get isolated instrument data with source separation in just a little bit, but for now, I'm going to talk about the transcription problem. And to do that, I'm going to talk about this project, uh, uh, MT3, which was led by another Magenta intern. Um, but before we completely dive into MT3, I'm just going to define what automatic music transcription is. Excuse me, what automatic music transcription is. So automatic music transcription is the task of converting an audio signal into a human readable musical score or a transcription. I like to think of this as the musical analog to speech recognition systems that turn uh, recordings of human speech into text data. You can see an example of transcription shown at the bottom of the screen, where a transcription system turns the recording of the yellow bass guitar into a piano roll transcription in the MIDI format. So another neat thing I like to think about transcription is that it's the opposite of playing a piece. When you play a piece, you turn a set of notes into audio, and when you transcribe a piece, you turn an audio into a set of notes. So to set up what the transcription world looks like before MT3, I'm going to look back a few years at a project we did called Cerberus. Cerberus is actually a source separation network that we modified to do both separation and transcription. And while I'm not really going to get into the details of here, the important thing to know about Cerberus is that Cerberus is really a straight-of-the-head, run-of-the-mill analysis model that uses an LSTM to do one-shot inference without any kind of inspiration taken from generative modeling. There's no sampling process. The, it's a stack of LSTMs, which is kind of even outdated at the time that we published it. So um, here uh, is where I would play the output of Cerberus so you can hear it. Um, but I'm going to skip this really quickly. Um, I will maybe actually play along, uh, play the video along. Um, and I'm going to have to vamp for a little bit because the video is a little bit long. Maybe it's not even playing. OK, we're just going to skip the video. But the important thing to know here is that it's great that separation trans Cerberus can do separation and transcription, but um, the, you'll have to take my word for it. The results from Cerberus, uh, at least on transcription, are just OK. Um, one thing that you would hear if you were able to hear this is that it got the, there's a, a excerpt of a piano and guitar mixture. It got the guitar line playing a single note audio uh, really well, but it actually did a horrible job separating or um, transcribing the piano. So there's a lot of room to grow in terms of the results, but another important point uh, part about limitation of Cerberus is that the instruments are fixed. Once a Cerberus model is trained, you cannot ask it to separate a new instrument without either retraining it or just expecting some funky, wacky results. So the piano and guitar model that I would have just shown to you cannot describe, uh, transcribe a saxophone or a drum set without retraining it. And so this brings us to MT3, uh, as I mentioned, a project led by Josh Gardner and Ian Simon at Magenta. MT3 stands for multitask, multi-track music transcription. And one of the ideas behind MT3 is to use an encoder-decoder transformer architecture. 
Transformers are a neural network architecture used for generative modeling, pretty much standard at this point. Um, they're most commonly used in language tasks, but they're also starting to see some use in vision and audio tasks like transcription. Uh, maybe the most famous example of a transformer is OpenAI's GPT-3 language model that generates new language based on a prompt. But here, the insight behind MT3 is that we can treat transcription as a sequence-to-sequence -sequence task, where the input is a spectrogram, which we can treat as a sequence of spectral uh, frames. And then we input that spectrogram into the MT3 transformer model, and the output is a sequence of tokens, and we can design these tokens such that they look a lot like MIDI events. Because the, uh, the encoder-decoder transform architecture is a generative model, it has a sampling process. But instead of sampling new data to, input, input our, uh, to mimic our input distribution, like I showed you earlier, we sample transcription tokens directly from a MIDI-like vocabulary. So this, this vocabulary is actually designed to mirror the MIDI specification, with specific token types indicating the instrument ID, the note number, timing of events, note on-off indicators, and so on and so forth. A set of these tokens actually makes up a transcription, which can be stored as a MIDI file or in the piano roll format or, format or any way that you actually manipulate um, MIDI files. One of the main appeals of this vocabulary is that we can now train MT3 on any data set that we can get our hands on, and the only real limitation to the output data is what data we have. This allowed us to train an MT3 model on every transcription data, fit, data set we could find all at the same time. So we compared this giant MT3 model to all the models, including the Cerberus model I just showed you and the commercial software Melodyne. In this graph, MT3 is blue, which are the high bar bars, and higher values are better. And clearly MT3 is able to take advantage of all of this extra training data and get better transcription performance than any other system that we've tested against. Here is where I would show you another example comparing, directly comparing the output of Cerberus and MT3, where we only listen to the transcription outputs. But um, I'm gonna cut right to the chase here. Maybe I can actually just show you what's going on. Nope. So I'll cut right to the chase here. Um, just to, and again, if you wanna see this, I'm giving this talk again in a few days, but uh, no worries if you miss it. Um, so the, as we recall, the, the Cerberus example captured the guitar really great, but it didn't do the piano. And what happened with MT3 is actually just the opposite. It captured the piano perfectly, which is actually a really complicated piano part. And it's, it's really, um, uh, it's a little bit impressive that it got it so well, but the, um, the, it missed the guitar part completely and it ended up putting the guitar into the piano. And that's actually one of the big failure modes of MT3 is that the, what makes it so great, it has this wide vocabulary. Sometimes it doesn't know how to use it correctly. So it'll misassign different instruments um, very often. And this is one of the things that we're working on uh, fixing with MT3 currently. Um, okay. So in summary, MT3 uses an encoder decoder transformer to do automatic music transcription. Not only is the neural network architecture borrowed directly from the generative modeling literature, but we also are sampling from a vocabulary that lets us train on many possible data sets. Uh, again, if you wanna see this, uh, Josh will be presenting this next month at iClear. So finally, we're gonna turn to the first of two source separation systems that I worked on uh, called Tagbox. The first is called Tagbox. But before I get into Tagbox, let me first tell you exactly what source separation is. And when I talk about source separation, I find it's helpful to think about how music is actually recorded. So typically when musicians make a song in the studio, they record each instrument by itself in isolation such that each instrument has its own track. A mixing engineer then combines all of the instrument tracks into the version of the song that we hear on the radio in a process that's called mixing. Source separation is the opposite of this process, where we start with the song that we might hear on the radio, and do and we want to do some magic to get back these original isolated instrument tracks. So if we look specifically at this guitar track, what we really want to do is effectively mute all the sounds that we hear that are not guitar sounds. One problem with the music separation world is that these music data sets are small. The standard data set MuseDB18 is on the left of this chart, and Slack 2100 is just to the right of that. If we compare these two to the speech data sets, we can see that our standard data sets, our music data sets are tiny. Speech data set has, we can argue that speech data set has much less diversity than music data. And on that note, I wanna talk about data diversity. While the MuseDB data set contains recordings of live musicians, it only supports four source types, vocals, drums, bass, and this fourth catch-all source that combines every other source under the sun, which is kind of called the other source. On the other hand, the Slack data set has support for 34 instrument types, but all of the audio is synthesized, so it's not clear how well models trained on it will generalize to recordings of live musicians. 
So one of the problems with source separation is how do we get access to models that have been exposed to more data? And by more data, I mean both in terms of raw hours of audio and more source types. This is the core drive behind Tagbox. Tagbox is a separation system that combines OpenAI's jukebox with a music tagger. I'll talk about more about each of these pieces in just a second, but like, hey, when you look at that, a generation model and analysis model working together. Huh, how thematic. Okay, let's talk music tagging. Music tagging is the task of predicting tags from raw audio signals. These tags have semantic meaning, like genres or moods, uh, or indicating if a particular instrument is present. The music taggers that we're gonna use are all pretty much convolutional neural networks, but let's talk about a big reason why we wanna use music taggers in the first place, and that's data. Again, I'm showing you the same two separation data sets as before, MuseDB and Slack, and if we compare these to the music tagging data sets, it's clear that the tagging data blows the separation data out of the water in terms of sheer number of examples in these data sets. So a music tagging model trained on a standard data set has seen about 300 times more data than a separation model trained on MuseDB. But the sheer size of the data isn't the only thing that's nice about these music taggers. These instrument tags are way more diverse than what MuseDB supports. With standard tagging music data, music data sets, sorry, with standard music tagging data sets, the resulting models have seen up to 16 different types of instruments and compare that to MuseDB's four source types. Great, so music tagging check. The only question is how do we go from this tagging data to separation data? And this is where Jukebox comes in. Jukebox is a generative model for audio. If you haven't checked it out before, I would definitely recommend listening to the examples. They are mind blowing. Specifically, Jukebox is a set of VQVIEs and transformers, although in this work, we're only gonna use one of the VQVIEs. If you want more details about how Jukebox works specifically, you can either read our paper for an overview or read the Jukebox paper itself for a detailed uh, review. Um, and because this model is from OpenAI, we know they're gonna do everything bigger and better. So through the use of high powered computers and even higher powered lawyers, they were able to train Jukebox on 1.2 million songs. And I really can't help myself. Let me just show you another animated bar chart. Here's our friendly neighborhood music separation data sets and the tagging data sets I showed you before that. And Jukebox's data just leaves them all in the dust. So Jukebox has seen a whole lot of data, orders the magnitude more data than any source separation model is. So let's see how Tagbox brings these two pieces these two pieces together, the jukebox and the music tagger, for source separation. The core idea behind Tagbox is simple. When the audio of an isolated source like the solo bass guitar is input into a music tagger, only the instrument tags corresponding to the bass source should be active. Therefore, we're gonna fix a set of predefined tags corresponding to our bass source and pass a mix through, the, through jukebox. We're gonna iteratively optimize the audio output of Jukebox until it matches those tags. And we're gonna run this optimization procedure until those tags match, and we're gonna run it on each audio file individually. Let me talk about this in a little bit more detail. First, we're gonna put a mixture into Jukebox's encoder and get a, some location in its embedding space. We're gonna then decode this embedding space back to audio. We'll use this Jukebox decoded audio to apply a mask of the mixture. Now, this is an important and subtle point Jukebox can generate audio wildly, but this masking step keeps Jukebox from generating any old audio under the sun because what we're doing is restricting Jukebox to only removing audio information from the mix. We're then gonna pass this masked audio into the music tagger and compute a loss between the current tags and our predefined source tags, say our base source or any other source we wanna separate. And we're gonna use that loss to guide gradient descent in the embedding space of Jukebox. We're gonna run this optimization process until we're, we're satisfied and out comes a separated source. The cool thing about Tagbox is we don't need to update the, uh, update the weights of either model. We can only update the location in the embedding space, but the tagger and the rest of Jukebox are completely frozen. Also, neither Jukebox nor the music tagger have ever been trained to do source separation. Recall that the music tagging data is really just, uh, just one-hots or multi-hots. But we can combine these models to do source separation with this setup. And all of this is without access to paired data with mix and sources, as a typical source separation might have. So let me show you how this compares to previous systems. So first we're gonna look at Repit Sim, which is a very old algorithm at this point, and we're gonna use that as a baseline for an unsupervised algorithm. Notice that this method is a vocal separation algorithm, so all these other sources that are bass, drums, guitar, piano strings from these other two data sets kind of don't really have definitions and don't really make sense to separate with this, um, with this algorithm. Yet, 
Tagbox has really has tags for these things, so we can provide a well-defined source separation estimates, which are all about the same quality for all of the sources that we test across both of these data sets, MuseDB and Slack. And now we're going to look at a state-of-the-art purpose-built supervised separation system, DMUX, and we're going to see how Tagbox compares to it. Not surprisingly, this does remarkably well, except for when it doesn't have any training data, like in the Slack uh, sources for guitar, piano, and string. Again, we're going to compare Tagbox to this, and of course, DMUX is going to beat Tagbox because DMUX is uh, a, a purpose-built source separation system. Um, but it's only going to beat Tagbox on the sources that DMUX is trained on. But again, DMUX or Tagbox can provide separation estimates for all sources. And in fact, Tagbox is the only system that we tested that was able to provide source estimates for all of these sources across both of these data sets. So here is where I would play you some audio examples from Tagbox. Um, I encourage you, I'll have a link at the end of the section at the end of the paper to go listen to them. Um, it's actually, it's not as you as you might expect, right? It's not as good as maybe DMUX or these other purpose-built state-of-the-art systems, but it's surprisingly good for the fact that we're only updating one embedding space throughout the whole process. It really speaks to how good um, these general purpose audio models like Jukebox are, and when they're combined with a, a really strong prior from a music tagger. Okay. So I'm going to skip through both this stuff. Okay, so with Tagbox, we repurpose the generative model and analysis model and coerce them into doing source separation without retraining either one. This is, again, another project showing off the symbiosis of generative modeling and musical scene analysis. Um, and if you want to talk to me more about this, I will be talking about this at ICASP next month. Um, finally, in the last few minutes, I want to talk about another separation project called Nate separation that applies the idea of gener the generative modeling idea of autoregressive sampling to learn the interdependencies between different sources. So in an auditory scene, musical sources are highly coordinated. Musicians create sounds that are designed to overlap in time and frequency content. Think tempo and harmony. These are important parts of music. These interdependencies can make it difficult when we want to isolate audio from a particular instrument, such as in source separation. However, most music separation systems treat each source independently. These systems are only conditioned on the mixture, ignoring any any dependencies that might occur between sources. Furthermore, some systems crystallize this as a hard prior into their design by training only one network per source. What if we want to model these intersource dependencies that we know happen? Well, let's again look at gender modeling for inspiration for how a model can learn the dependencies. A common technique in general modeling is autoregression. In fact, we've already seen it. MIDI DDSP use autoregression to generate these node expression controls. And the way we set up autoregression in raw audio is by conditioning the model on previous time steps when it estimates, estimates the next time steps. This is how WaveNet and a bunch of other autoregressive models work, for example. Given information about the past, predict the next audio examples that, are, that will happen in the future. In this way, the model learns the relationship between dependencies in time. When we think again about source separation, music, and we talk, we, as we talked about how music, source separation, music sources are all interdependent, so if we want to do some kind of autoregressive style learning to learn the dependencies between sources, we don't want to set up our autoregression in time dimension like we just saw with, with WaveNet. Instead, we want to autoregress along this so-called source dimension. If we can do this, then we can use an autoregression to learn these intersource dependencies. But there's a problem. Unlike the arrow of time, which always flows from the past to the future, there's no real natural ordering between these sources in a mixture. Should the bass come first or should it come last? Is the guitar first or second or third? What about the singer? So how do we learn these conditional dependencies between sources in an autoregressive manner? And this is what orderless NAID training is designed to do. NAID stands for Neural Autoregressive Density Estimator. Uh, I, I believe actually started at Mila, by the way. Um, and it's designed to learn these dependencies between things that where there's no natural order. Thus, a system trained like this can learn these inner source relationships. So to do this, we need a special training setup. We're going to alter a multi-source neural network so that it has inputs for sources, and for each training iteration, we're going to condition on a random subset of input source data. During inference, we're going to run a sampling procedure called a block give sampling procedure to iter iteratively redefine from an initial set of estimates. Here's what the training setup looks like. Like I said, we've altered the network so that it has additional input slots for these sources in addition to the, uh, the standard input for the mixture. At each training iteration, we randomly choose a subset of the input sources to make unavailable, which is a process we call masking, and the network's loss is then computed only on the output sources that are masked as input. This forces the networks to learn these intersource dependencies. 
For nade separation systems, we can also run a sampling procedure in a similar manner to a generative model. Here, we're going to propose using a block give sampling procedure, which looks like this. At the first step, all of the input sources are masked, and this is the typical source separation setup, where we only have the mixes input. The network then makes its first set of estimates for these sources, and we put these initial estimates into the source slots into the next iteration. So we're going to hold these over to the next iteration. Just like in training, these initial slots are going to be randomly, uh, we're going to randomly apply a mask to these, these input estimates from the initial estimation. From this step, we only keep the outputs from the source slots that are masked, and for the unmasked sources, we're going to carry over these source estimates from the previous step, so in this case, from step one. Um, as is normal in science, we conducted a set of experiments uh, where we modified a DMUX architecture for, for NADE training. Specifically, we compared uh, standard training to training with uh, NADE training and GIV sampling, and we're going to test the performance with respect to the number of GIV steps on the Slack 2100 and these DB18 datasets that I showed you in Tagbox. And here are the results on the Slack data set. Each, each, uh, each graph here represents a different source and higher values are better. The horizontal dotted line is standard training without any of our bells and whistles with NADE and GIV sampling. And the changing line is our model that has um, NADE, sampling, or NADE training and GIV sampling. Note that the x-axis on each of these plots is the number of uh, GIV steps, which is logarithmically spaced, and the number right next to the name of the source, the top number, indicates the maximum improvement over NADE training, so any time there's a max between that standard horizontal line. So we can see that more GIV steps monotomically produces better estimates in three of the four sources, which is great. The only source that it doesn't produce monotomically better sources is this drum source all the way on the right here, and it might be hard to see, but the drum source from the standard training is already so high, it's about 20 dB, um, that it's hard to imagine the separation getting any better there, so there's really not a lot of room to grow. On the MuseDB dataset, um, the performance boost is most pronounced in the vocals all the way on the left, where we see the same kind of monotomic increase with more GIB steps. Um, other sources don't see as drastic an improvement from the GIB sampling procedure, but they start at a much higher point, which maybe indicates that orderless need training itself has a beneficial effect when we learn these um, dependencies between these uh, uh, different source types. Um, one thing to note here is anecdotally, the, the rise in uh, the vocals all the way on the left here, um, I've, after listening to a bunch of examples, I, I'm inclined to believe that it's from turning off these other source estimates, so you hear maybe some bleed from the drums or other, and the initial GIB sampling procedure, but uh, as we get further and further along in the sampling process, those bleed go away, which leads to the dramatic rise in um, SDR for drums and, and explain, or in vocals and explains why these other ones are relatively flat. So this is needs sub separation, where again, I borrowed some ideas from generative modeling to learn the inner, de inner source dependencies between different sources. Um, we'll be presenting this, I'll be presenting this again at ICAST if you have more questions, um, but I wanna kind of summarize this talk uh, where I presented four recent projects that all marry aspects of generative modeling and musical scene analysis. MIDI DDSP is a generative model that enables realistic synthesis and expressive control. MT3 enables better transcription of more instrument types by using an encoder decoder transformer. Tagbox, Tagbox repurposes generative, a generative audio model and a music tagger to do source separation without retraining either model. And finally, NADE separation uses autoregression to learn the interdependencies between sources when we're doing source separation. I hope I've made some kind of convincing argument that there's lots of room for cross-pollination between the areas of gender modeling and musical scene analysis, and I'm looking forward to seeing how you can provide new insights that power the next generation of musical instruments. Um, before you want to go, I want to thank all my friends and collaborators, um, especially the left row, uh, which has members from my lab, the Interactive Audio Lab um, at Northwestern. Um, without any of these people, none of this work would be possible. And yeah, thank you so much.